Uh, I won't stand behind the there because there's an aircon vent just there and uh, it's a bit cold. And anyway, if I stand there, you won't be able to see me. So I'll sort of wander around here somewhere. My name's Brian, that's Rabina, wave Rabina. And what we want to do this evening is split the evening to make it a little bit more entertaining into two sort of 30 minute sessions. And we'll both deliver about half of each of those sessions. And then in the middle, um, I'm going to run a little 10 minute quiz. Not like a pub quiz, uh, it has a purpose. Um, so, you know, more of that later. It's mostly just to relax you, but it has a purpose. So you'll need a bit of paper to write on, or your, your iPad or whatever. Um, in the unlikely event that a slide comes up there that you find interesting, you may feel you need to take notes. Do so if you want, but you know, we will be making a PDF version of the whole thing available to you, which you can download from the website. Ian will uh, make all of that happen. Um, if, no, not if, it's absolutely certain that I will say some outrageous things. And if any of them seem particularly outrageous and move you to ask a question, then feel free to butt in. That you don't need to wait till the end to ask a question. Ask any time you want. It makes it more difficult for me to manage the time, but hey, who cares? I've been doing this for a while. So, uh, without further ado, agenda. Uh, we're going to have three sort of sessions, as I said. The first bit is about managing your own destiny, and the last bit is about thinking differently. Uh, now, these, uh, you might think, what? What's that got to do with technical team leading? Well, both Rabina and I have, have led all sorts of technical teams, engineering teams, IT teams, uh, business transformation teams, change teams, um, you name it, we've led them. And one of the things we've discovered is the differentiating factor between being able to lead well and do an adequate job is not your technical skill. Yeah? The differentiating factor is the interpersonal skills and your ability to influence, build trust, inspire, motivate, and essentially get people to volunteer their precious resources to do what you want them to do rather than what they fancy doing. And so our three books are all about that. The middle one's called uh, Delivering Benefit. And you'll be pleased to know there isn't a spreadsheet anywhere. It's not about you know, business cases. Delivering benefit is about understanding what your customer needs. So that's the, the basic premise. So in trying to think about what to do tonight, we wanted to give you a little flavor of those things. And that's why we've come up with those two titles. Yeah? So point one, life is not a lottery. You know. Um, too many of us go through life and through our professional life wondering why our boss treats us differently than everybody else. Wondering why that Burke over there got promoted and we didn't. Yeah? And it's easy to sort of persuade yourself that this is the hand that you got dealt. Yeah? And there's nothing you can do about it. Well, we don't believe that. Uh, we believe that you don't need to be that invisible person sitting there, really competent, but unnoticed. Uh, first outrageous thing, nobody, I'll say that again, nobody ever got promoted because they were good at their job. Mm. Yeah. You get promoted because you convince somebody you're going to be good at the next job. And you cannot demonstrate your ability to do the next job by doing your own job. Doesn't matter how well you do it, doesn't work. So if you want to demonstrate your ability to do the next job, you've got to convince your boss to let you do some of his job or her job. Yeah? And that's about how you get them to delegate to you, and they're not going to delegate to invisible people. So, 
the first thing I want to talk about is first impressions. And that doesn't mean the very first time you meet somebody, because every interaction you have with every single person that you ever meet is an opportunity to influence how they perceive you. Every interaction is a first impression. And people work with people they like and they trust, and trust is built one Lego brick at a time, but it's destroyed ever so easily. Okay? So, um, I'd like to draw your attention to something called stereotype. Uh, this is, if we sort of, Rabin is the neuroscientist, neuroscientist, but essentially the primitive brain is really good, the amygdala, really good at stereotyping. It's based on the fight or flight mechanism, and based on very, very limited information, you classify people into they're one of us or they're one of somebody else. Yeah? I should be happy with this person or I should be frightened with this person. Yeah? Now, that's basically the, what the brain is really good at. It's fantastically good at pattern recognition. Yeah? I call it pattern recognition. Rabina calls it stereotype. Now, given, it doesn't matter how little information you've got, the brain will find a pattern. The interesting thing is, once it's found a pattern, it gives up. Yeah, job's done. And no matter how much contrary information comes in, it's unlikely to let go of that pattern. Okay? So stereotyping is really important to you. So what do other people tend to think, and this is not a rhetorical question, it's a real question, what do other people <coughs> tend to think is a stereotypical image of an IT person? And I, having worked many, many years in the IT, no, there's no such thing as an IT person. You're all doing incredibly different tasks. Yeah? But other people don't know that. So how do other people think of IT people? Introvert. Introvert. They think we're introverts. In my case, they're dead right. I am. What else do they think? Slightly far along the autistic spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> we, we may be... Fairly advanced on the autistic spectrum. <laughs> I, I, I prefer not to own up to that one, but it's it's possible. Anything else? Male. Male. Yeah. In the old days, absolutely. Less so these days, thankfully. Still I think, in but, and that's yeah. What we're trying to address. But, yeah. <laughs> what else do they think? Techie. What else do they think? Techie. Techie. Absolutely. They think you have zero interpersonal skills, that you're techie, that you're problem focused, that you can't communicate, and you absolutely cannot communicate to the business. So ideally you should be put in some sort of darkened room somewhere and only let out on high days and holidays. What I want to suggest to you is you can do something about how you are perceived by others. You do not need to walk into a room and be labelled by everybody as Jill from IT or Joe from accounting. Yeah? Your aim is to be Jill, the person who always turns around failing projects, or Joe, the person you absolutely need to have by your side on a difficult contract negotiation. Yeah? This is about brand. Now, for the last 10, 15 years, I've worked a large amount in the uh, FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods with R&D people, developing products, all sorts of products, hair care, you name it, all sorts of things. Do I need hair care? Absolutely. Um, and they use, in their marketing and with their R&D people, they use something that's called the brand key. And that's so that, you know, if you're developing a different sort of dove, it fits with the brand image of dove, the brand key. 
And what I did, because I, I was finding so many people that understood, scientists who understood the concept of a brand key, I thought, well, I could take that concept and apply it to people. So I've adopted the brand key for us. Yeah? So let me show you some brands. Um, what do those brands mean to you? Let's take the uh, Lloyd's Bank down at the bottom left there. <laughs> is that Lloyd's Bank? No. No. What is it? Ferrari. Ferrari. What does the brand of Ferrari mean to you? Fast cars. It means fast. It means what else? Expensive. Sorry? Expensive. Expensive. What else? Luxury. Luxury. Elite. Elite. I love that one. Prestige. Prestige. Hands up those people who've actually driven the Ferrari. One, two. I've okay. Been in Ravinas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hands, up, hands up if you've sat in one. Yeah. So essentially, the group has zero experience of Ferraris, pretty much, but you all know what that brand stands for, yeah? intuitively, because they've spent years building that brand. Okay, you can do that for yourself. This is the brand key, the way I've adopted it. And right at the center of the brand is the essence of the brand. What is the essence? That should be a short statement, eight, ten words. Yeah? And then around the brand, we have evidence. Yeah? Why? Why is, does it do this? Why does it do what it says on the tip? What makes it unique? Yeah? What are the benefits of using this brand? And what are the values and personal attributes that are associated with the brand which will rub off on you? Essentially, that's how it works. Now, most people, when they do this, um, depends on your background, if you're a sort of detailed person or a sort of big picture person. If you're a detailed person, you'll probably start filling in the boxes around the outside and then afterwards come to the middle and try and think what that should be and then you iterate round a little bit, you car carve out the middle a bit and go around the edge again. Uh, if you're a big picture person like me, you'll start in the middle and craft that. Now it changes over the years, but what I want to do is show you what my brand is. Let's start in the middle. I help people to grow by learning about themselves and their environment. Okay, a uh, quick advert. I started life as a mechanical engineer. I designed um, huge machines in the paper manufacturing industry. Uh, I worked in the aircraft industry designing bits of planes. I've been an engineering officer in Her Majesty's Grey Funnel Line, uh, where I was making ships go rather than shooting at people. Uh, but, you know, you have to make them go before you can shoot at people. Um, and I've been an IT consultant. I've driven 100 million pound strategies. I've been an academic in the States, working for the US government. Um, I'm, I run one of Europe's largest training companies, and I'm an academic now, sort of. OK, so. Those are all very different things, but they all have a common thread, and that common thread is whatever I was doing, whether I'd be a naval officer, or an engineer, or an IT consultant, or whatever, I was developing people. That was the most important part of my job, always. Because if I got that bit right, everything else took care of itself. So I define myself in terms of how I develop the people. And that's true of every conversation I have. If I have a conversation with somebody in Starbucks that I've never met before, I find myself trying to help them develop. How do I do that? Well, um, this bit down here, the benefits, how do I do it? I used to think, years ago, when I was an academic in the States and reading three books a week and four or five different uh, management journals, I thought I needed to know stuff. 
I thought I always needed to know more stuff than anybody who might be sitting in front of me. Um, thankfully, about 15 years ago, I realized that was wrong. I do know stuff, just you know, serendipitously, but that's not why people hire me. Nobody ever hired me in the last 15, 20 years because I knew stuff. They hired me because I make them ask questions they wouldn't ask themselves. I make them challenge what they believe about the world, how it works. I ask difficult questions. And I help them to ask difficult questions when I'm not there. That's why they hire me. The fact that I know stuff is serendipity. Okay. Uh, what's unique about me? Well, there's a bunch of things that are unique. In, you know, I've been an engineer, I've been an IT consultant, all that sort of stuff. But also what's unique is, I left school at 16 with no qualifications. I've now got more degrees than a thermometer, and some local university made me a professor. Yeah? All of that happened outside of the normal educational cycle. Okay. Uh, reason to believe in, well, I've done this for real. I've done it, you know, I've lived and worked across Europe, I've lived and worked in the States, I've run all sorts of companies, I've worked in the public sector, the private sector, I've written books, you know, I've won prizes. And one of my values, the main one is the only source of competitive advantage is how quick you can learn something new. That's my value. There are other values as well, but absolutely, like a stick of rock, if you cut me out, it would say learning through the moon. Now, once you've got your personal brand, then you have to say, how do I live it? How do I consistently live these behaviors so that people who've never seen that will recognize that in me. So when I walk into a, a room for the first time, they sense that. What do I do? Now the first step to that is to build yourself an elevator speech and start saying that to yourself. Yeah? Monitoring what you're doing, how that is landing, what people are saying, what people are saying about you, how people are interacting with you, how people are taking your ideas and running with them. It's not a one-hit process. You keep doing it. You keep monitoring. It's called reflection. One of the things I do a lot at the university is I work with doctoral level practitioners on reflective practice. That's the main thing I work on, reflective practice. Yeah, they learn some other stuff too. But if anybody goes away from me with a doctorate and they haven't become a more curious, reflective practitioner, I really don't want to see them walk across the stage and get their doctorate. You know? I feel I've failed. If all they've done is learn some more stuff, that's not what doing a higher qualification should be about, learning stuff. It should be about fundamentally asking different questions of yourself and understanding why you believe the things you believe, how you came to believe them, and how believing those things limit your ability to see things, perceive things, do things differently. Nobody asked me any questions, so it must be Rabina's turn. And we're running. About three minutes left. Okay, corporate politics. Now, I'd like to start off by asking you a question. And I want you to imagine for a moment you're a fly on the wall at a board meeting and you're listening to the dialogue and discourse that's going on and how the board members of your organisation are making decisions about your organisation. What percentage of the data do you believe is concrete, factual, objective information? <coughs> Throw some numbers at me. 10%. 10%? Yes, 
Five percent? Zero. Zero? <laughs> I'll go to twenty. Twenty? Any more? Okay, so we've got somewhere between zero and twenty percent. Let's have a look at the figures. Two to three percent. And what's the rest? Well, it's based on people's opinions, perceptions, interpretations, and it will be coloured by our own beliefs, aspirations, and assumptions. And what does this translate into? Organisational politics, your ability to influence or otherwise, your reputation, which Brian's been talking about, and of course, the relationships you build. And that is the territory that Brian and I have been working in with the books over there. Now, another question for you. When I mention the word corporate politics, what words and phrases spring to mind? Relationships. Relationships. Backstabbing. Backstabbing. Upmanship. <laughs> Sorry, cliques. Upmanship. Upmanship. Sorry? Favoritism. Ever present? Favoritism. Favoritism. Sorry. Favoritism. Nepotism. Sorry? Nepotism. Nepotism. Empire. Okay. Empire building. So, in essence, not a million miles away from that list there, okay? However, as Roger over here mentioned, corporate politics are also about this list too. Influence, collaboration, building relationships, openness and honesty, absolutely being streetwise and looking for the win-win. Because, what would a political free organisation look like? There isn't one. How big would it be? One person. One person. Providing, of course, they weren't schizophrenic. <laughs> because as soon as you get more than one person, you get different viewpoints, different opinions, and that's where corporate politics creeps in. And it's all about how you handle those differences. Now, you can handle them in a negative sense like this, but you can also handle them in a positive sense like that. So we often construe corporate politics as being dirty, nasty, horrible. In fact, you'll find very few books written about it because most people avoid the subject because it's a bit non-PC. However, corporate politics, as you said, are a fact of life. And from my view, it's dealing in a positive way as opposed to the negative. Now, um, this is the results of some research that I did when I was based at Cranfield School of Management. And what we were looking was for what gave leaders political success in the long term. Now, I do stress the long term. Two key dimensions. One, understanding the world in which you work. And second, how you choose to behave. Now, taking the first dimension first, how are decisions made in your organisation? Is it because you've got a visionary leader at the top? Is it because we did it this way last time? Is it small incremental planning? Is it because the government changed the rules and the goalpost changes? All those sorts of things. Understanding both the over and covert agendas of the key decision makers. Now I've used the word covert rather than hidden because covert agendas are not necessarily bad. For example, I've got lots of covert agendas I haven't shared with any of you. Not because I'm deliberately hiding them, it's just not appropriate in this setting to share. Now, if any of you invited me to have um, a glass of wine with you after we finish this evening, you'd probably get me to start opening up and sharing those covert agendas. So it's about creating the right environment that would encourage me to share. Understanding who has the power in the organisation and what gives them power it's not just position power, it could be because you're the boss's secretary or PA, it could be because um, you have a particular skill or expertise that people find useful for, useful. It could be because you're a smoker and you're a little smoking grapevine somewhere in the freezing cold. Or it could be because you're just a fun, interesting person to be with and people enjoy your company. All those sorts of things. Um, understanding and extending your locus of influence. Now, a few years ago, I did some research in terms of IT professionals who made it to the position of chief exec. Not too many around, quite a difficult route, and there's a fairly rare breed who achieve it. 
And one of the key characteristics that all the people I studied shared was that throughout their careers, even when they've been junior programmers, they'd look for opportunities to go above and beyond the job description. They hadn't said, it's not my job, I'm too busy, go and talk to Harry over there. They'd taken an active interest in helping people, and in so doing, got a broader understanding of the business as a whole. So it's about extending those, those boundaries, not just keeping into your professional area. Understanding the culture and style of the organisation and what the word politics means in your context. Now the second dimension, um, the scale goes from actual integrity to playing psychological games with people. And in terms of long-term success, it is about actual integrity because if you don't, you'll be found out. And research suggests that it takes between 15 and 18 months to get found out. And that's why you hear stories of senior executives moving job, moving organisation every 15, 20 months, because that's the length of time it takes them to become ineffectual. People figure out what they're doing and they get sidelined or fed misinformation and they cease to become effective. It's also about recognising that we're human beings. None of us are perfect. And it's okay not to be perfect as long as you're prepared to be open and honest who you are, know when to ask for help, apologise when you get things wrong, and neither should we expect other people to be perfect too. Teams can be, individuals are not. And it is about looking for the win-win. Now, for example, I could go into a meeting with position A, you could have position B, what we could do is argue the toss, get more and more entrenched in our respective views, end up sort of stamping our little feet, locking horns and pushing. Alternatively, we could share our viewpoints, pull our knowledge, and then use brainstorming techniques to come with the position C, D, E, F, G, H, till we find a position equally acceptable to both and probably better than A or B in the first place. Now, that does take time, energy, effort, it's not worth doing for every trivial little issue, but it is worth doing for those big, important ones. Now, if I put these two um, dimensions together in a classic business school matrix, I get my political zoo. So, I've got my innocent sheep who acts with integrity, but hasn't got a clue what's going on. I've got my clever fox who knows exactly what's going on, but using that knowledge to exploit the weakness in others. I then have my inept baboon, who neither acts with integrity nor knows what's going on, and my wise dolphin, the icon of political success, who knows exactly what's going on and using that for the good. A few words around my animals. Innocent sheep sees the world through very simplistic eyes, believes you're right in a position of authority, does what he's told, sticks to the rules, there's a right way to build a system, there's a wrong way to build a system, too busy to network. Now, can I ask you, what do you people do with your lunch times? I talk to other people. Sorry? I talk to other people. Great. Usually go home with other people. Good. Coffee, drinks, whatever. Okay. Go for a walk. Yeah, for that. With people or on your own? Okay. How many people would confess to eating a sandwich whilst catching up with their email? Okay. Lunch times are for networking. Getting out, building relationships with key decision makers, key stakeholders in your organisation in a slightly less formal environment and encouraging them to share their covert agendas. Now believe me, that is an overhead in the beginning once you start doing it, but the long term that will more than reward you because you'll find instead of having a three hour meeting to discuss something, you can do it in three minutes if you've got the right relationship. And it's going to be far more beneficial to A, your own personal career, and B, your organisation as a whole when you've got those relationships. So get out there, network, not just with your own peers and colleagues, but people you don't know in your organisation, key stakeholders, key decision makers. Now, contrast my sheep with my clever fox, who recognises but exploits the weakness in others, self-centred, self-centred, 
thinking to themselves, often they have the charm of an ear like the slick sales guys. Deep down, um, they're often insecure. They don't show you because they're well defended. And incidentally, that's how you capture the foxes at the end of the day. You play on that insecurity. And of course, they like games involving winners and losers as long as they're the winner. Now, what happens when a sheep gets fed and slaughtered by the fox and says, OK, Mr. Fox, I'm going to play you your own game? Now, bear in mind you can change your behaviour overnight so you can move from right to left. However, you can't move from top to bottom overnight because it takes time to gain that knowledge and understanding. So when a sheep tries to play foxy, he ends up in baboon territory. Because they're not tuned into the grapevine, those antennae are blocked, Therefore, he ends up conspiring with the powerless, emotionally literate, can't read people, and very much sees the world in black and white. And also, doesn't recognise when they're fighting that losing battle. And incidentally, that is the story of all the runaway systems projects that should have been canned a long, long time ago, and nobody is prepared to make that difficult decision. And the aim of the game, the wise dolphin, who takes account of other people personally, excellent listener, aware of their viewpoint. You don't have to necessarily agree with it, but everybody has the right to their point of view. Non-defensive, opens and shares information, doesn't keep it back as power, and using creativity and imagination to engineer those win-win scenarios. Now, inevitably, um, there's a bit of each four animals in each of us, but it's about your prime behavior and sometimes I use this model to check out my own behaviour from time to time. And I'll give you an example. Now, um, I was a full-time academic at Cranfield School of Management for four years. Um, I'm not anymore, but I do go back there and teach from time to time as a visiting fellow. And I went back there um, a couple of years ago, and I was faced with a situation whereby an ex-colleague of mine had stolen and published some of my research material. Now, as you know, that's a pretty awful crime in academia, plagiarism. At Cranfield, it was crime number two. It was almost a second offence, but not quite. <coughs> and my first reaction when I found this out was to do nothing. I thought, I'm not a full-time academic anymore, don't need this publication record, it's not worth the hassle, the aggravation, I'm just going to let the matter drop. And then on reflection, I thought, if that's all I do, I'm being a sheep, because I'm ducking the issue. Next thing I did was I had a whinge and a whine to another ex-colleague of mine who was just about to take early retirement. And as I did that, I realized I was conspiring with the powerless, therefore I was being baboon-like. Then somebody suggested that I reported this person to the head of school, and I thought if I did that, it would have had a fairly detrimental effect on their career. And for me, that sounded foxy. And I thought, what would the dolphin do in this context? And I thought the dolphin would confront the person, make them understand they'd done wrong, hopefully embarrass them sufficiently so they wouldn't do it again to anybody else, and make them put the errors correct in the paper. That's indeed what I did. Took a bit of courage, but I had my say, got my point of view across, and they even um, offered to put my name as third author, something I didn't ask for. So for me, that was dolphin behavior. Where do you think the stereotypical IT person sits? <coughs> bottom left or bottom right? Yeah, I think mostly bottom right. I think they're the in, mostly the initial sheep because I think they're well-meaning, um, but sometimes it's too much just getting the head down. And this is what happens when sheep meet spots. <laughs> Intermission, and I'm going to hand over to Brian, who's going to take you through the quiz. And well, you need a pen and paper. Absolutely, not a very big piece of paper. <laughs> um, now, quiz. Let me give you some rules. Um, if you haven't got a piece of paper, there's little pads coming round, there's pencils coming round. Um, I'm going to ask you ten questions. They all have numerical answers. They all have numerical answers which you will not know. Okay? But it's not fun if everybody gets zero out of ten. So instead of writing one answer down, 
you can choose a range. So let me explain how this works. If, for instance, the question was, how old is Brian? You could look at me and think, well, he looks like he's left school, so he must be over 18. And he seems to be walking around without the aid of a Zimmer frame, so chances are he's under 90. So he's somewhere between 18 and 90. Yeah? And if you said that, you would be 100% sure that you were right. But, I mean, that's just a meaningless range, isn't it? That carries no information whatsoever. It would be futile to write something like that down. Would it not? Yeah? So. It depends on the parameters. Let's, well, let's test this. All right? <laughs> How old is Brian? And what I want you to do is write two numbers. Well, no, not write it down. We'll just run with this. You have a guess, two numbers, yeah? And you can choose the band, and since you're the most embarrassed looking person here, <laughs> you can go first. How old is Brian? Band. So it has to be a band, not two numbers. Two numbers in a band. I'm somewhere between 18 and 90. Or, <laughs> or, don't be shy, I won't get upset. Oh, okay, I'm going to say 40 and 70. 40 and 70. 40 and 70. Ooh. Okay. That's, a, that that's, that's a relatively <laughs> meaningless band as well, isn't it? So let's refine this a little bit. I, want, I don't want you to be 100% sure that you're right, because you're 100% sure there, aren't you? If you're 40, oh, you, you haven't worn very yeah. much. I haven't. 80% sure. 90% sure. I want you to be 90% sure. So, okay. Young man, how old am I? Uh, between 50 and 60. Between 50 and 60? <laughs> By the man of gin and tonic. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Go on. Thirty-two, fifteen, spirit. In spirit. Yeah. But in body. Yeah, I need a full body transplant. Okay. Um, I. Enough of this. I am actually forty-six, or at least I was twenty years ago. <laughs> okay. So. Are we ready? We're going to have 10 questions. Question number one, you're going to write two numbers down such that you are 90% sure that the correct answer lies in your range. Let's not have any meaningless ranges. Yeah? <laughs> Question number one. At what age was uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, when he was assassinated? I'll even help you by giving you a picture, but that's not necessarily a picture taken on the day he died. Yeah? Could have been taken years before, years afterwards. We all got two numbers down? Splendid. Question two. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's the operating empty weight of an Airbus A380? I've helped you by showing you a picture in kilograms. In kilograms. I, I mean, come on, you're, you're all very smart, elite, IT, professional, surely you know this stuff, okay? The operating empty weight, it doesn't have to be Singapore Airlines as long as it's uh, an Airbus A380, 800. In kilograms, we all got two numbers down? I'll give you a clue. A bag of sugar is two and a half kilogram. <laughs> two pounds. Sorry. Just under a kilogram. So how many bags of sugar is that? Is what you're asking, really. Okay. Is this information going to be useful? Uh, it might be. You never know. Number three. How many books are there in the Catholic version of the Old Testament of the Bible? Now, it's important that this is the Catholic version, not the Protestant version, because they are different. Uh, so, two numbers. How many books in the Old Testament Catholic version? We all ready for question number four? Mm -hmm. Oh, splendid. Uh, what's the gestation period of an Asian elephant? Actually, the African elephant's about the same. In days. It's just slow to see we don't recognise the other person. How long between having nookie and <laughs> giving birth? <laughs> that elephant is not pregnant. That elephant is just tired after a long day. 
you know, when I said earlier, he asked me a question, that wasn't the sort of question I expected, really. Question five, what's the circumference of the Earth measured through the poles, that is different through the poles around the equator, through the poles in kilometers? Two numbers. Through the Earth. Round the Earth, that's what circumference means. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone heard of Gibbs and Hawks? It's called Gibbs of Thieves, Savile Row. I went there once a few years ago to buy a pair of trousers. And I said, I'd like a pair of 30 waist. He said, no, sir. <laughs> sir may be a 32 or even a 34, but sir is not a 30. To which I said, yeah, that's circumference around the waist. I said, look, Buster, these are 30. Just get me a pair of 30. And he got them for me. And I went into the changing room. And it, it was a struggle. But I managed to button them up and staggered out of the changing room. And he said, oh, my god, sir, don't sit down. <laughs> uh, so 32 is my circumference. Question number six. Uh, what year was William Shakespeare born? I'll give you a clue, it was before they invented detachable collars. <laughs> it felt a bit rough. Very good. Thank you so much. Next. Uh, what's the length of the Great Wall of China? The wall section only, not the bits that are just bits of stone there. In kilometers. Anybody walked along the Great Wall? Lovely, isn't it? Once you get past all the salesmen. We all got two answers. Lovely. Question number eight. What's the orbital period of Saturn in days? Now I'll give you a clue here. Saturn's a little bit further away from the sun than we are. And our orbital period is 365 days. So it's going to be more than 400. Yeah? Uh, what year did Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart die? See, I could have said, how old was he? But no, no, no. I'm interested in when did he die? And finally, what's the melting point of pure gold in degrees Celsius? Two numbers. We all got 10 answers. Anybody, if you haven't got 10 answers, wave. Okay, now, you all look like trustworthy people. So I'm going to let you mark your own. I don't know why we're bothering you with this. Because I know, I know you all got 9 out of 10. Because, remember what the rules were? You were 90% certain that your answer. Now, I know the statistically minded amongst you will say, no, these are all independent events, Brian, so, you know, it's not 9 out of 10, we have to do the sums. But, you know, let's go with the labels for you. You were 90% certain you've got the right answer, so you should get 9 out of 10. You may mark your own. Here are the answers. Martin Luther King was 39 years old when he was... Assassinated. <laughs> uh, the operating empty weight of an A380 is 276,800 kilograms. <laughs> Golly, that's a lot of bags of sugar. There are 46 books in the Catholic Old Testament. Of course, it, uh, looking around, there are a few Protestants here. There's only 39 in the Protestant version, but there are 46 in the Catholic version. Okay? Uh, the gestation period of an elephant is about 22 months, which is 645 days. <laughs> we did the 10% correct. No. <laughs> no. You've got a range. You're not allowed to now start adjusting your range. Okay. 
Uh, the circumference of the Earth through the poles is just over 40,000 kilometers. 40,008. I suppose actually it varies a bit depending on the thickness of the ice, but you know, 40,000. Shakespeare was born in 1564. Wall of China, 6,260 kilometers long. Take you a while to walk along the Great Wall of China. <coughs> Orbital period of Saturn is 10,750 days. Just a bit more than 365. Oh. Mozart died in 1791. Yes. And finally, melting point pure gold is 1063. Add up your scores, please. <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, uh, because you're all high achievers, IT folks, you understand numbers. There will be two or three of you who got 10 out of 10. Uh, would you like to take a bow if you got 10 out of 10? Uh, right, okay. Well, remember then that the, what the rules of the game were. So you've all got 9 out of 10. Would you just raise your hand if you got 9 out of 10? Oh dear. <laughs> this has never happened to me before. <laughs> Maybe. 8 out of 10, raise your hand. 7 out of 10. 6 out of 10. Oh, did you say, did you wave at 7 out of 10? Give the man a piece of cake. <laughs> wow, wow. Wow. How big were his ranges? Yeah, well, we, let's not embarrass him. <laughs> <it. laughs> 6 out of 10? Nobody. 5 out of 10? <laughs> One person. So we've got, we're, we're down to 4 out of 10 now. We've only had two people got it right. 4 out of 10? Just, I'll stop now. I don't want to embarrass anybody else. Now, what have we learned from this little quiz? This is totally useless information. Of course it is useless information, <laughs> but <laughs> absolutely, we never miss an opportunity to convince ourselves that we know more than we do. Yeah? I said you could choose the range. You all managed to convince yourself you actually knew something about these things. So you put narrower ranges. You said a meaningful. Yeah, meaningful. <laughs> but, all right, how many people got the, the number of books in the Old Testament right? Four of you. Okay. I mean, for goodness sake. I, I don't suggest you read the Old Testament, but surely you think, well, that's quite a big thing, you know? Only about a third of it's the Old Testament. You know, must be somewhere between 30 and 50. You'd be right. But you, most of you got it wrong. So, we never miss an opportunity to convince ourselves that we actually know more than we do. If we're so bad at estimating numbers like this, what does this tell you about all the business cases you put together? What does this tell you about every time you go up to one of your team members and say, how long is this going to take you? And they say, five days, boss. Yeah? Yeah, I think. What does this tell you about all our project plans? There's only two things in project plans. Estimates of duration and dependencies. We've just demonstrated we're rubbish at estimating duration. Yeah? What does this tell you about any number you ever see that is a single point number? The only thing you know with any certainty is it's wrong. Yeah? And what do spreadsheets do? I see people build business cases. There's no way you could get within 200 grand of being right. And they've got it to three decimal points of a pound. Because that's what a spreadsheet does. It's rubbish. We're useless. We know nothing. Yeah? <laughs> I'm a professor. I know nothing of any consequence. Okay. Does that make you feel good? 
<laughs> Seriously, I tell you, I am 66 years old. I cannot remember ever seeing a project plan that was worth the paper it was written on. Because most of the data in it is totally fictitious. I have never seen a business case for a new product launch that had any chance at all of getting within a couple of million of it. Or in some cases, a couple of tens of millions of it. Yeah? We have to recognize when we actually know what's going on and when we're dealing with totally spurious accuracy. And single point numbers are bad news because they're suggesting you actually know what's going on. And most of the time, we don't. Okay. I said I'd be outrageous. Was that outrageous enough? <laughs> We're moving into the second half. Uh, this is about thinking differently. Is that different enough? An orange apple. Um, I've been working with leaders in all sorts of industries for more years than I like to think. By the time I was 20, 25, I was leading people, you know, two, three hundred people. Uh, in life-threatening circumstances, sometimes. So I, I've sort of learned something about leadership over the years. And I've worked with many, many people in lots of different leadership capabilities. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. People I admire, the people who've been most successful, the people I would wish to model myself upon, had certain characteristics. Most importantly, they were unidirectional. Yeah? They were very capable of taking, and indeed holding, multiple perspectives at the same time. That sounds strange, but the ability to embrace and hold different assumptions, different perspectives, and to do that at the same time is a key characteristic of good senior leaders. The best bit, I'm not one about the term mindful, it's a bit, you know, a bit modern, but they are capable of mindfulness. They're capable of staying calm in the face of all sorts of mayhem. They're capable of protecting themselves in terms of their own health, well-being, mental health. And they care about other people's stress levels and well-being. All the best ones have a purpose. They know where they're going. And they know why they're going there. And they're able to inspire other people to volunteer and share their purpose. You can't give somebody a purpose. Purpose is a very personal thing. It's built on your own assumptions and values. You can't inflict a purpose on someone else. But you can help them find a share of your purpose. Yeah? And they create, again, this is a bit West Coast trending, but they create positive emotional spaces. And how do they do that? Well, I've come to the conclusion, it takes me a long time to get there, but I've come to the conclusion that the key skill to do that is through asking questions. Questions that open up possibilities. Questions that look forwards rather than backwards. Questions that place a focus on what we can do rather than what we can't do. Simple picture. Uh, I hear that mantra in, in boardrooms. I've heard it a lot over the last 15 years. If we always do what we always did, we'll always get what we always got. Yeah? Einstein in the 1930s said it a little bit more elegantly. He said, the problems we face today cannot be solved by applying, applying the same level of thinking that created them. Okay, so essentially Einstein was saying, if you always think what you always thought, you'll always do what you always did, and you'll always get what you always got. 
Now, I'm not suggesting I know more than Einstein. No, but I, even that, I think he was slightly wrong. I would say, if you always see what you always saw, you'll always think what you always thought. So for me, the key to changing any of this is to be able to see, perceive things that were otherwise closed up to you. And in order to do that, you have to get into your head and understand what's limiting what you see. We live on a continuum, past, present, future. Most of us tend to be anchored somewhere around here. Our mental anchor is about here. And we tend to be looking that way. Psychologists call that past focus, deficit-based thinking. Past focus, deficit-based thinking. Actually, it's what TQM is based on, isn't it? Past focus, deficit-based thinking. The mental model is if we only could understand what we did wrong and do less of it, we'll get better. Great model. I love quality. The quality initiatives have been very helpful. Yeah? It's not the only mental model. You could alternatively say, if we could only understand what we're doing right and do more of that, we'd be able to achieve different things. My purpose in life is to try to help people move their anchor from there to about there, and for at least 20% of the time, look that way instead of that way. Okay? That's proven to be more of a challenge than I'd hoped. Okay, so the key is to ask questions. I've also come to the conclusion there are six sorts of questions. I'll go through them in pairs. Sorry. Yes? What if the anchor was far on the right? It, it was far on the, on the right. On the right. It's, it's unusual. Um, but there are people who do have their anchor there. Elon Musk, for instance. Yeah, rare though. Rare. Uh, questions in pairs. First pair of questions uh, are about clarifying events and options. Yeah? I call them analytical questions and probing questions. Analytical questions are about trying to understand cause and effect. Yeah? If, this do, if I do this, then that happens. Probing questions are seeking more information. Yeah? So, for instance, you get what do we normally do when, or what sequence event of events preceded, what might happen if we integrate this with that. Yeah? Probing questions, what was the temperature when this happened, you know, etc. Engineers, accountants, IT people, scientists, or and scientists are brilliant at asking analytical questions. And probing questions is what we're trained to do at university. It's what we're trained to do in our organizations. It's what we do really good. I would say about 90% of all questions I've ever heard asked by anybody falls into one of those two categories. Now, even then, you can phrase them in the past, the present, or the future. Okay. Probing questions tend to be past focused by definition. Most analytical questions are past focused, but they need not be. I know you can do this. Let's move on. The next pair of questions are a little bit more useful. Reflective questions and affective questions. Let's deal with the bottom one first, affective questions. These are about motion, emotions, feelings, yeah? So they take the form of, you know, what was, uh, how is this change impacting morale? What would it feel like to work in? Now, notice the difference about those two questions. How is this change impacting morale? Is that past, present, or future focused? Present. Where's the data in order to answer that question? It's missing. It, well, it's the dot, dot, dot. Yeah, where will you look for the data? You look for it in the past. Yeah, present and past. So it could be present focused, but mostly the data is in the past. 
this question, what would it feel like to work in an organization that, yeah? That's future focus. Just by changing the words, you can change the nature of the question. A key thing as a leader is to develop a personal sort of mechanism for monitoring the words as they come out of your lips. I have often been in situations where I've had two, three hundred people working for me. If I ask a question, that could generate 600 man days of effort just like that. Yeah? And if I'm not paying attention, we've wasted a whole shed load of money before I realize that I asked a dumb question. So monitoring your own ability, yeah, and what sort of questions are coming out of your mouth and the sort of things that they're going to create in people is a key skill. Uh, we move to reflective questions. Reflective questions, uh, we're all happy about the term reflection. It means thinking about thinking, yeah? Simplistic. Thinking about thinking. It actually goes a bit deeper than that. It's not thinking about the processes you're using to think. It's thinking about the assumptions that constrain yeah, the, your personal beliefs. So reflecting is about identifying your personal beliefs, guiding assumptions, cognitive frames, call it what you want, yeah, that govern what you're able to see. So you're asking yourselves, why do I believe that? Yeah? My experience working with engineers, IT people, R&D scientists, is we're pretty useless at asking affective questions, generally. And we're pretty useless at asking reflective questions. And most of our organizations make matters worse because we put a priority on action. And people are sitting around thinking clearly on acting, so they're useless. Okay? So it's getting worse. There's not enough reflection. And what really winds me up is when I see a chief executive of a major organization like you know, Ford or something, retire and say, my biggest regret is that I didn't have enough time to reflect. And I think, what? That's what you're getting pay the big bucks to do, Buster. You know? Don't tell me, you know, you've got to wait till you retire before you start doing some of that. That's what you're paid to do. So those are pretty important questions. The last pair of questions is the most important question of the lot. I call them explorative questions and fresh questions. Let's deal with fresh questions first because fresh questions are a bit like reflective questions but they're not saying why do I believe this? They're saying why do we? Why does this paradigm exist? Yeah? Classics. FMCG, you know? You want to increase sales? You might think, oh, increase marketing spend, yeah? Obvious. The other thing they do is, actually, if you're a Unilever, it's not about marketing spend, it's about trade spend. You want to increase sales, throw some more money at Walmart, yeah? Don't increase your marketing, throw money at Walmart. Nobody ever questions that the logic of that. It's a given. Well, that's great. Unless Procter & Gamble are throwing money at Walmart at exactly the same time, then you've got nowhere. It's a dumb paradigm. It might work sometimes, but you've got to think about it. So, fresh questions challenge the accepted paradigm. Everybody, anyone heard of Thomas Kuhn? Mm. Yeah, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book many years ago called The, uh, the Structure of uh, Revolutions. Basically, thank you. So, thank you so much. I'm getting old. I wrote about it in my 66. You know, I forget. And basically, what he was saying is, you know, the world chooses to believe one thing until it reaches a tipping point, and then suddenly it switches over and starts believing something else. So, you know, in the 1970s, there were people who were bemoaning greenhouse gases, you know, the greenhouse effect, and most. Responsible scientists said, yeah, who sucks, they're idiots, you know, don't listen to them, whoa. Yeah. There came a point when that tipped over. 
Okay, so that's about paradigms. And the other questions, these explorative questions, are about, they're all future focused, they're about what could we achieve? What new things would we be able to achieve if we did this? Yeah? Who else could benefit from this? What else could we do that would make this even more? Boom. Yeah? They're always future focused. Those two are the most powerful questions that you could ask. Stupidly, when I first started working with science, scientific R&D people, I thought they'd be brilliant at that. And I discovered that virtually none of them ever asked a question like that. They were all too busy asking probing and analytical questions. Those are killer questions. I see too few of them. So, what am I urging you to do? I'm urging you to ask more questions and try and focus your attention and get better at asking better questions. Questions that open up possibilities. Questions that look forwards rather than backwards. Questions that focus on what we can do rather than what we can't do. Sadly, far too many managers and leaders use questions as a weapon rather than as a liberating force. They use questions to belittle people. Yeah? I see it all the time. The purpose of asking questions is to challenge, challenge paradigms, but also to support new and positive thinking, to create positive emotional spaces where people can do something new and different. And the reason I've written coaching at the bottom is the number one capability that you need to, as a coach, is the ability to ask questions and then listen. Those are the key capabilities. And when Google wanted to try and get their management to be better, and you know, being big data people, they big data it up and down on yin yang, and what came out of it was not that our best leaders are the ones who are technically best. What came out of it was our best leaders happen to be our best coaches. If you can find somebody who's really good at coaching and promote them, you've probably got yourself a really great leader. So this is not just altruistic, you know? this is something that can help you develop. If you get better at asking the right sorts of questions, you build better teams, more effective teams, more powerful teams that do stunningly different things. Thank you. Get off the soap box, shall I? Have I another slide? I don't think so. No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. I always thought we did the what caused it to be late today. Oh, I deleted that one. Okay, fair enough. Okay. So, um, the fourth part of it is influencing. Now, have any of you ever given a presentation and you know you've had the best idea in the world or the perfectly crafted case and yet the presentation hasn't worked quite as well as you hoped? Ever happened to anybody? Okay. Well, the chances are it's nothing about the content of your presentation, but it's got everything to do with the style, the way you put it across because it's style that grabs people's attention and then when we grab their attention they listen to us and we have the opportunity to communicate effectively and to influence them. So this is all going to be about style and the first rule is forget the golden rule don't treat other people how you wish to be treated yourself because they may be different from you. What does it for you, what presses your buttons is not necessary, what does it from somebody else and if you can learn to speak the language of the recipient you're far more likely to engage and have that opportunity to influence. Now, at this point in time, I'd love to do a little bit about personality profiling, but clearly I haven't got time for today. So you're just going to have to believe me and trust me. Or you can always read the book. So, essentially, there are four types of people in this world. Okay? Um, pragmatic, theoretical, idealistic, and sociable. Okay? Now, where do we find these four types of people? 
Well, the majority of the pragmatic type um, sort of gravitate to professions like IT, finance, science, engineering, and HR. So statistically, in this room, probably the majority of you will be the pragmatic type of people. Okay. So very logical and analytical. Then we have the theoretical. Now these are big picture, but it's big picture logic. And this will be your chief exec. It will be many others in the C-suite. The idealistic people. Now these are big picture, but it's more big picture humanistic values. Um, PR, creative designers, and we are starting to see more and more of those increasing in the C-suite these days. And then the social people, um, they're very caring about people, individuals, and you find a lot of those in the caring professions, um, hospitality, healthcare, also primary school teachers, um, receptionists, secretaries, etc. So that's where we find them. Where would you put the greasy sales people? <laughs> uh, sales people are here, marketing people are there. So, four different types of people, therefore you need four influencing strategies. So, in your pragmatic type, you need to be practical realistic and offer proof and evidence that it's worked for others. And that explains why pragmatic people like best practice, um, <coughs> scorecard, because it's all about proof and evidence that it's worked for others. Does that resonate with some of you here? Best practice, of course, is in that category too. Theoretical people, they just want to the big picture. They don't want lots of detail or data, and they want you to appeal to their intellect and imagination. The idealistic people, they want pictures, analogies, and you've got to present it with passion, and what's important to them is the greater good, is, is people, but it's people en masse rather than individuals. And with the social type, every individual is important and I care about and I wouldn't want even one individual to be disadvantaged by my strategy. So more explicitly, if you were doing a presentation to the different types, this is what you might do. So, pragmatic type. You do the classic thing you're told to do in the self-help books. You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them it, you tell them what you've told them. Only issue is, self-help books tend to be written by people, by the pragmatic types, so they only tell you what works for them, not the other types. So, with a pragmatic type, you start with your agenda, you are logically and systematically through analysis, showing how it works, how it saves time and money, etc. You conclude your summary, you answer all their questions, and if you can, you let them try it before they buy it. Pragmatic types like bullet point lists, they also like graphs, pie charts, bar charts, tables. However, all your axes have got to be labelled properly and all the numbers have got to add up because they will do the arithmetic and if there's any error in your maths, your whole presentation will lose credibility. Also, you've got to be efficient and effective in your use of data. You've got to have sufficient to prove your case but not <coughs> data for the sake of it not data overload. It's all got to be relevant and pertinent to that logical QED, and if you've done the job properly, the answer will pop out as a natural consequence of that logical data analysis. Does that work for some of you? Okay. Now, show that slide to the average theoretical chief exec, and it's the biggest way to send them to sleep. Theoretical types do not like bullet point slides. It bores them rigid. What turns them on is models. And this explains why you get lots of models when you go to business schools, because statistically, most lecturers in business schools are the theoretical type. So of course, they give, them what, they give you what turns them on. And a model is a construct that adds meaning. It's not a list in four boxes. So with a theoretical type, the two most important things is your personal credibility and branding in theory. If you've got both, you'll make sense to your theoretical type. If you've got the theory, um, but no credibility, they'll think you stole the idea from somebody else. If you've got the credibility, but no theory, it's a case of good show, but shame there wasn't any substance. 
And if you've got neither, well, you're a waste of space. Now, apologies to any theoretical types here today, but they do tend to be the most arrogant of the profiles because they know they're right, but based on very little data. So by definition, a theoretical type will always have a better idea than you do. So the last thing you do is present them with a okay to complete conclusion because they will disagree on principle. It's the not invented here syndrome. So when you're trying to influence a theoretical type, it's a very fine line between having an opinion but not ramming that down their throat. So the best way of influencing a theoretical type is to draw a napkin doodle or a model on a flip chart and get to the point where they say, like your thought processes, like where we're going with this, that's quite clever. They take the pen off you and they start playing with it, redesigning your model and changing it. That's when you've got them. That's when you've won them over. It becomes their model, their idea, that's when you've captured them. Also, um, the other thing with these guys is that sometimes, now this is the level of detail they like, but it is, does depend upon you having credibility in the eyes of the person in question. And if you haven't had the time or opportunity to build that credibility, what they'll do is dive into some bit of detail. Not because they're interested in the detail for its own sake, they're just testing you out, testing your thought processes, making sure you've done your homework, you know your stuff. So you almost need 30 backup slides in your pocket, so when they ask that awkward question, you can pull out the relevant bit of information. Make sense? Sorry, I was wondering why HR people are included in pragmatic group rather than this one, because this sounds to me like the kind of uh, nature of people sometimes. That sounds like HR people, does it? Yeah. That's right. um, statistically, most of them are pragmatic, but you're always going to get the, you know, the odd exception. Uh, I was wondering because it was included in the other group in the first diagram, so I was just thinking that, you know, maybe, I don't know. Just, just wondering about the reasons why they were included in the other one rather than on this one because you know I think they share many of these uh, characteristics. They're normally fairly sort of detailed people, in sort of my experience. Statistically, but, I mean, you all get some exceptions, and also organisational culture might have an influence on that too. Successful entrepreneurs. Yep. Which group Entrepreneurs normally are the theoretical type because they're more forward thinking and they just go for it and they don't need the proof it's going to work. It's, it's just, let's do it. It's instinctive, it's gut feel. Okay, idealistic type. Sorry, went too far. Um, still big picture, still on the slide, but instead of the model, we have a metaphor or analogy. So I've used the children's game snakes and ladders. Ladders obviously things that work, snakes things that set you back. So what helps, um, how it enhances relationships, involves them in the process because they have lots of ideas. How it plays to people's strengths and helps them grow. Paint pictures, do analogies have meaning, be passionate, engage their imagination, and showing your visions and your dreams. Don't conflict with their personal values, so therefore there's no, do, no point doing an analogy of a football team if the, NF, sorry, if the idealistic type in question hates football, it's not going to work. Don't give them too much detail, and same as a theoretical type, if you give them a list, no more than three, their brains work in threes. And don't shower with facts and data. And then the social types, it's sitting down and having a proper two-way conversation, just as you would with a friend over a coffee or a pint, and not talking at them, not patronising them, not railroading them, but having a proper two-way conversation, um, picking up on their threads, and being prepared to listen and learn and modify your conclusions accordingly. And it's these people that are the ones that really understand what's happening at grassroots level, because A, they're in touch with reality, and B, people can find them so they know what really goes on. Also, they can be one of the, the type most reluctant to change. So these are the people that you really want to engage when you're doing a change project because they're the ones that are going to sort of hang on and want to do it the way they've already done it. So in summary, 
Um, you sell features to the pragmatic type, you sell benefits to the theoretic type, you talk concepts to the idealistic type, and you have fireside chats with the sociable type. Make sense? So that's all for Brian and myself. Thank you for being a lovely audience. And those are three <coughs> books we've, we've just written. And I think the BCS has a brilliant deal for you today. Yeah. We've got, uh, they're normally £10 each, and you can sell one for eight, two for 15, or all three for £20 today. Who was that aimed at? Um, we're going to make everybody can have a copy of these slides if you wish. We're going to make them available for you, and that's our contact details. So if you want any coaching or any training, or you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to contact either Brian or myself. And we're quite happy to socialise and ask questions, answer questions. And if you want to chat with us, we're here for a little while. So. Thank you. Thank you.